past this point, eventually, the object will become indistinguishable from human beings, and we'll be okay with it again. That area, right down there, is the uncanny valley. So why does this happen? The idea is that if an object is clearly not human, then its human-like characteristics will stand out and appeal to us. But if the object is almost, but not quite human, its non-human characteristics are all we're going to see. We know what a human looks like. We see him every day. So when something is off, we know it, and it's unsettling. But... Okay, so, I guess everyone knows what the uncanny value is now, yeah? Okay, good. So this is essentially the uncanny value. So what tends to happen is when you're doing graphics, you either want to be somewhere there or somewhere that you don't certainly want to be in there. Okay, so this is where we want to avoid. Let me just show you a couple of videos uh, to see. So this is a pretty realistic video. So I put this video, this is computer generated by the way. I put this somewhere here. So this is quite realistic. You could probably not see any subtle <laughs> difficulties, uh, any subtle problems in here. So it's, it's fairly, fairly realistic, as you can see, uh, from a, it's very hard to detect any, any other <laughs> Big Brown Brian beats his big brother Bobby with a baseball bat. Big Brown Brian beats his big brother Bobby with a baseball bat. Big. Okay, so one way to actually create this kind of characters is you can you can either go you can either, either try actually make it really really realistic or you can do some kind of stylization. So a stylization in the sense that you can create styles that doesn't necessarily actually look very very nice, but you have some kind of a style. So let's. Look at this one, we probably you all know. Makana show. Now, here you, you don't have realistic looking characters. But the point is here you have a kind of stylization. So, again, you tend to like this because you know that they're not really humans, but they tend to have human characteristics. Yeah? So, okay, so that's moving ahead. Now, the main problems that when we actually have the major technical difficulties is the digital data. So handling digital data, large sets I'm talking about here, images, videos, 3D data. And also, there's a problem of uh, developing intelligent algorithms for machine learning and artificial intelligence. So let me just give you some examples of how this works. So we have these uh, cameras. So in 1975, uh, we were able to create 0.01 megapixel camera. And then something like 2008, we can create 85 megapixel camera. And people are now working on 216 megapixel camera. So I'm talking about, so it's quite high, high resolution cameras. And if you, look, if you think about an average user, uh, uh, in, in, in coming years, we'll use about 8.4 gigabytes of uh, data in terms of capturing uh, videos. For if someone actually use the entire life videoing themselves, say the point where they're born until they die, uh, they will be using about 240 terabytes of data. So it's quite, you might think it's not a lot, but it's quite a lot of data. And the problem here is how do we, we have this data sitting in hard drive? How do we actually make sense of this? How do we analyze it? How do we search through this data and make sense? And this is, this is actually a very, very big problem in computer science these days. Now, the other problem is we think, we think that computers are very, very intelligent and they can do lots of clever artificial intelligence things. But let me point out a very simple problem that, the that, that we are still unable to solve. Now, you have this scene. You are asked, a computer is asked to find out where are the chairs. Now, the computer is going to confuse because it might think, for example, here, this is a shadow of a chair, which exactly looks like a chair, but then the computer will say it's a chair, but it's not really a chair. There are other things. Uh, so all these things, so it's actually a very, very difficult. So this is one of the problems that we pose when we are actually looking at this testing, this kind of a benchmark thing where we can see uh, whether our artificial al algorithm is actually really, really clever or not. Another problem that we pose is how many legs in this elephant? If you put into a computer algorithm, say AI algorithm, and say how many elephants, it will certainly get confused because it might think this is a, this is an, um, a leg. So these are sort of kind of problems that we pose to, to, to make sure that our algorithms that we define are actually clever enough to do clever things. 
what I'm going to be concentrating now is the kind of contribution that I have made um, in this field uh, briefly. Uh, of course, I've done quite a lot of projects, but I will be highlighting some few projects um, that I've been doing. So the essential idea that uh, I've been working um, in the past, let's say, five, five, ten years is how do we actually handle this kind of data? Now, there is our digital Emily, and what happens is you, cr you actually look at a proper, uh, so this the Emily is a real girl. We take a facial scan of this girl's Now, there is a lot of data involved here. Um, I'm talking about gigabytes of data here, and then how do we actually handle this kind of data? Now, when I was doing my PhD uh, some 15 years ago, uh, I think uh, I came up with this equation. This is kind of a magic equation. Now, what this does is you have an object here. So this is, let's assume, this is a, this is a three-dimensional object. Now, the way people represent this data is you actually have, uh, you basically just work out all the points in this object and basically plot these points on, onto the screen. Now, the way we thought about this is very different. We said, okay, this is not, if you, if you, if you imagine an artist asking, looking at me and trying to draw myself, he's not going to just simply jot, jot points on the screen. He's going to try to do this. So what we said is, let's actually do it, uh, pose this problem in a different way. Let's look at the features of this object. So the features of this object are you have a curve there, you have a curve there, and then you have a curvy bit here, curvy bit. So you can actually, basically, if you break down this object, the features are here. So utilize these features, and let's come up with a clever way of actually interpolating these features so that you get that object. Okay? So we came up with this uh, equation, which is called the biharmonic equation. Now, the biharmonic equation is actually related to uh, what we call Laplace equation. Laplace equation talks uh, about how heat distribution is when you actually heat a metal bar insulated on both ends. If you heat it, the heat distribution around this is defined by this called Laplace equation. Now, Laplace is a very, very, uh, is a clever mathematician, uh, French mathematician. Uh, by the way, he got his professorship when he was 18, so he's a very, very clever guy. And he came up with this equation. And we, in, in our case, we actually uh, looked at the biharmonic equation, the biharmonic equation, and we, we applied to this, into this area so that we can take these the characteristics of this object and then generate this, uh, this geometry. So suddenly you can see that if you, if you try to plot all the points of this, this is a very huge, huge, huge data, but you can actually change this into this kind of this, so the data, the, the amount of data that you actually play with is, it has become a lot smaller. So this is the essential idea that uh, uh, we have been working for for quite long. In fact, um, since we have been working on this equation, in fact, I think about this equation every day, and I still don't understand fully this equation. Um, okay, so the idea here is uh, you essentially say goodbye to raw data, you come up with an equation, so the mathematical equation actually tells you this is this object, this is that object, and you can easily write down formulas so that you can represent these objects. So these are some examples of the objects that we can create uh, very quickly. So if you start with one aircraft shape, you can go from one shape to the other very quickly using this equation. It's the same equation with different parameters that creates all these objects. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you now is about some of the example projects that I've been working, um, some of the recent ones, really. This is a project that, uh, that was funded by uh, uh, the Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council of the UK. So we were looking at how, quick, how can we actually model and animate objects very quickly. So the idea is actually to enhance how people model and animate. Again, we have been using standard set of equations. So this object you see here. Okay, so you can see the animations here. Now, the whole thing is driven by a mathematical equation. The way I see this is a single equation that actually does everything from the object to all, to all the motion. And same equation can be used uh, to do facial animation. So they, you can see this Robert De Niro here, by the way, myself, myself, and a, a colleague of mine. So it's the same, it's different faces, but with the same equation, you can actually drive the motion. And then here is another 
uh, underwater scene that we generated. So the whole